Oh, sorry. It's not on. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? So where is Amdak actually? No idea. No idea. He could be anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, he's been sick a while, hasn't he? Poor fella. He's not uh, adjusted to Ireland. Yeah. Okay. Fission and fusion. Is he camping out to get the, the first tickets? He has them. He has them. When's the show, when's it released? He's camping outside now, waiting. <laughs> he loves the Avengers. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> I'm DC. DC all the way. Okay. You got that fission infusion? Yeah. So, um, these are interesting things to look at. It's very, you would call this modern physics. This is like really modern stuff. Because, you know, Newton, that's what? 300 years old? You know, so this is really modern physics now. Um, a little bit to look at. A little bit to look at. So, this is an example of what we mean by fission. What you would have is something like uranium-235. So, you know the story. 92 protons, 235 nucleons. Uh, and what they do is they fire a neutron at the uranium. You can see in the picture here it hits the uranium. Uranium is unstable. It's very big. And the result is, when you fire a neutron at it, it will break into two. So 36 protons go this way and 56 protons go this way and three neutrons get fired off as well. They break out. So this is, a, I think this is barium and krypton, like in Superman. Or, or did they call it kryptonite or did they call it krypton? I think they call it krypton. But it's named after Superman's uh, kryptonite. Um, I, I read, or is it... No, no, see, no, I can't remember. Is it? No, I think it was first Superman had Krypton and they named this after it. They named it after him? Yeah, I think so. You can, you can Google it to find out. Um, anyways, we, we, you can check that in a minute if you like. Um, and three neutrons come out as well. Okay. Now, um, what I would like you to do, just to draw this. Now, look, you don't have to do it as detailed as this. So you could just draw one circle here and it's splitting into two with the three neutrons coming out. We can label it all.
Got that? Yeah. Do you want to go into Google and type in, is Kaor named after Superman or something like this? Well, whoops, the heck, sorry. Did you? What's it say? It says that the planet is the name the world of Superman yeah. is named after the elemental. Oh, rats, I thought it was the other way around. So they named the planet after the element, not the other way around. I prefer, I prefer my version. Okay. Okay. It's weird because it says that it was Superman was created before this was discovered or something. I checked the date. So it just means they introduced to the story his home planet. Like, in other words, his home planet wasn't part of the original Superman story when it was created. I don't know. No, I, I, I do know that they added Kryptonite later in the story by accident. Probably, because it was created before Krypton was. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I thought what happened was they made up and then they named the element afterwards, but it's the other way around. Okay. <laughs> All right. Do you know? Do you know the origin of Kryptonite in the Superman story? Do you know how they introduced it? It was by accident. So originally, Superman was a radio show. You know, like before TV, they read out the stories every week. One week, the voice actor for Superman was sick, so they had to make up some reason why he wasn't in that episode. So they said, "Oh, he's allergic to kryptonite and is sick and is not <laughs> and is not in today's episode." And uh, ever since then, it kind of stuck, became part of the story, because people like the idea that he has a weakness. You know, so it was just by accident. It wasn't part of the original comic. Well, that's a little fact for you, which won't be in the physics exam, but it should be. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so this is an, a picture example of fission. So before um, we look at the definition, what might you describe in your own words the definition? So this is what you might call the, the fission of uranium. So what, how, would, how might you describe it, this process you're seeing here? What might you say? Yeah, we think you should have done about splitting. So, um, you won't be surprised then to see that the definition is nuclear fission is a nuclear process, obviously. Uh, it's when an atom splits apart into smaller atoms. And the process gives off a lot of energy. And this energy is used in nuclear weapons and nuclear reactors. So this is what they use in the power plants and the weapons, this process, okay? So uh, you could, of course, have this definition in the exam. It's not too difficult. So what's with the cap cam? Is this like your new look or something? No, I just, I didn't think it was right at the moment. Oh, okay. I thought this was your new look. Campus, don't you? Yeah? No. Have <laughs> you got this written down? Yeah. Do you remember the chart we did last week where we had the fusion and the fission on the, the graph? So we said the elements to the right, you can you can use those elements in fission, and the ones to the left you can use in fusion. 
Does anyone remember the point in the middle that splits the two atom lists? Does anyone remember? Remember where it goes up to a peak and comes down? Remember the atom that's in the middle? No? No? Iron, wasn't it? Yeah, do you want to have a look? You drew, you drew this picture, didn't you? Yeah. yeah, that one. Yeah? So, what's coming on? Oh, okay, whatever, whatever. Goodness, so busy, sorry. I have like 10 things to do at once. Um, atoms which are heavier than iron. So obviously uranium is, because you see uranium is like the last one. It was the last one on the list. You can use those in fission. Yeah. Um, and of course later today we'll have a look at what fusion is. Now, uh, you, this is uranium as well. You can release lots of energy by using what's called a chain reaction process. So imagine you have some uranium and you fire just one, just one neutron at one uranium isotope. What happens to this isotope? You know it breaks into two, releases energy, and three neutrons come out. So here in this picture is an example of two neutrons coming out. If the uranium is dense enough, if it's the right density, then what you can do is have those two neutrons that come out hit more uranium. So what will happen when those two hit? This will break, this will break, release energy, and then two more neutrons come out. Now do you see how quickly the energy increases? It goes one energy, Unit released, two, four, what will be the next one? Eight, 16. Very, very quickly, that energy keeps multiplying by two. And all of a sudden you have, you know, the nuclear explosion, the nuclear power plant, just lots of energy coming out here. This process is called a chain reaction. And each level is called a generation. So the first uranium that breaks is called the first generation, and then the next level that breaks is the second generation. It's a lot like families, you know, it's the same idea. Uh, so this process is called a chain reaction. Uh, I think it's enough to draw the picture. Please also mark off first, second, third, fourth generation. So the first generation, I guess you could call it this first neutron, and second generation is when these two neutrons come out and so on. Got that? You drew that? Yeah, we can continue. Okay. So the definition is a nuclear chain reaction is a nuclear reaction in which a heavy isotope, such as uranium or plutonium, splits. And the neutrons released by this process strikes and splits other heavy atoms, which, 
As a result, hit others one after another. Chain reactions are the main way of getting nuclear energy. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of anything that you could delete there. I suppose you could delete the last sentence. Um, but I think that's all. Sorry, it's a long definition. There you go. You have all this already, Super? Yeah. And Kim, you have it? Yes. Yeah, Matt? Okay. Now, you understand this process only works if you have the right amount of uranium. So, for example, imagine that your uranium atoms are quite far apart. Then it means when this guy breaks and the neutron flies off, it might not hit the other atom. Can you picture that? You know, like, here's, here's my uranium, here, 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 like here it is all here. If this guy breaks, it would break into these. But if, if I have a low density, then when this one breaks, it might not hit those atoms. And so you don't get the, the process. So you need the right amount of uranium or plutonium. Uh, and this is called the critical mass. And the critical mass is um, the mass you need so that the reaction can take place. Okay? If you have less than the critical mass, then you don't really get the chain reaction. So we say there's not enough freed neutrons to continue the process. But if your mass is more than or equal to the critical mass, then there are enough freed neutrons to continue the process. Okay? Now, you don't have to write this down if you understand the idea, but you should at least write down the first sentence, at least. But I know if Chow was here, he would write the whole thing down. Chow keeps good notes. It's just a pity that he's not always here or on time. Yeah. Yeah, there's not, there's not many lessons left, is there? Just two after this. Exciting. It's like my picture of the Wolverine class. Sure are. Nope. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Some kind of tree. <laughs> right. Now, 
Um, I'm sorry to tell you this, but well, I'm not really sorry, I guess. Um, the next thing you have to do is look at what a nuclear reactor is, which isn't, you know, simple. It's a nuclear reactor, for goodness sake. So before you draw this, we need to explain how it works so you can have the idea in your head, okay? Yeah, 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 I know. Let me explain. Okay. Now, um, you see these red lines here? These are called uranium fuel. So basically it's just uranium. And the uranium is decaying. So it's releasing lots of energy. But there's enough uranium so there's a chain reaction. So you know then there's a huge amount of energy coming out. So it gets really, really hot. So then what they do is they use something like sodium or just water in this container to cool the uranium down. Okay? So what happens when the water gets hot? Um, they have to take it out and they cool it down here in this tank. So let's see. Uh, yeah. Um, this water will start to boil and become steam. And the steam comes along here and turns a generator, you know, like uh, the AC generators made out of the magnets. And this generates electricity. So then the hot water comes back out uh, and becomes cold water. Let's see. Um, this cold water here comes from like a river, for example. So just to be clear, cold water goes in goes in this pipe and it comes out as hot water. Why? Because the steam comes out here and hits this pipe and cools down. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, it's not really clear, but this water, can you see this pool of water here? It's in a loop. It keeps going around and around. Around and around like this. So what happens is it's in here, it gets pumped into this tank, it becomes really hot, it becomes steam, it moves the generator and comes out, hits this pipe and cools down back to liquid water. Okay. Now this cold water can come from a river, but it can also come from drinking water. So sometimes what happens is if you live near a nuclear power plant, the cold drinking water for the town goes in and comes out as warm water and it's still clean. Do you understand? Because it's it's in this pipe. You know, it hasn't gone around the system. So if you live near a nuclear power plant, you get free hot water. This is true. Do any of you live near a nuclear power plant? No? Do you even have nuclear power plants in your home country? I don't think you do. So Korea? I live in Ah, uh -huh. farm girl. Huh? Farm girl, you're from the countryside. No, I live in Seoul. Oh, do you have nuclear power in Seoul? I don't know. I don't think it's like Seoul specifically. I mean, like the part of it, like not in Seoul. Oh, you're in residential areas, is it? Yeah. yeah, there's no new, no power plants nearby. And not? No, yeah, no nuclear power plants. None at all. Yeah. So. If you live by one one day, uh, you will get free hot water. Okay. Now, the only thing I can explain here is here it gets very, very hot. And you have these things called control rods. You see those black things here? The purpose of these is to, I guess, block some of the energy. You know what I mean? Like, if this is getting too hot, what you do is you push these down, and it's like they cover up the uranium. They like like a shield, yeah. So they're usually made of something like carbon, so or, or some uh, uh, material that is a good shield to cover up the uranium, yeah. Also, of of course, you understand the material has to be very strong because you don't want the material to melt. That's important, okay. Um, do any of you know any nuclear disasters? Not, not the one in Japan, uh, like ones that were caused by machine failure. Because the one in Japan was caused by um, a tsunami, an earthquake, yeah. Do you know any other disasters? Chernobyl. Chernobyl, yeah. You've heard of this one? Have you heard of this one? Yeah. 
Do you know what happened in Chernobyl? No. What happened was this reactor was getting too hot, okay? Uh, and so they needed to cool it down. So they tried to push the control rods down, but the control rods were getting stuck. They wouldn't move down. Because what happened here is some of the material melted and it stuck to the, to the controls. So it, it couldn't be pushed down. It was like fused together. So what does that mean? Well, if this can't be pushed down, this gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and then you have a problem big problem. What could you do if this starts to get too hot and you need to cool it down? Huh? But you can't, but, no, <laughs> this uranium, it just gets, no, but, this uranium just gets hotter and hotter. And unless you can cover it up with the control rod, then it just keeps getting hotter and hotter. It, it's, releasing its own energy. It's a natural energy. It's not like a machine, you know? So what could you do to cool this down? Yeah, so usually what happens is there's like some um, emergency valve here because th these are usually beside a water supply. So when this starts to overheat, they open this up and they let lots of seawater into the reactor to try and cool it down and then it comes back out into the ocean. So they try to uh, use lots and lots of ocean water to try and cool it down. And then this gives them a little bit more time, you know, maybe like six or eight hours to try and figure out what they can do to release the control rods. Now, I think in Chernobyl, they weren't, the, the power plant exploded, didn't it? It released lots of radiation into the town. Um, and it's unfortunate because they didn't clean it up afterwards. So the radiation went into the soil. So it means the ground is radioactive. But because they didn't clean it up, the radiation sank into the ground. So it's like, it's like two meters into the ground. So if you wanted to clean up the town, you would have to dig up the whole town, like two meters of earth. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, not, it's not like it's on the top anymore. It sank to the bottom because they didn't do anything. It was really, really, really handled badly. Like just, you know, like the accident and the cleanup, it just, you know, it's terrible. And this is part of the reason why people don't like nuclear power, you know. But, you know, it just means that you shouldn't maybe let, I don't know, communist countries perhaps have nuclear power plants, you know. Maybe it just means you need to have a, uh, I don't know, how can I put this nicely? Higher standards, perhaps, that's all, yeah. Um, now, in the exam, I think what they sometimes do with this question is they might ask you to explain uh, a part of it. So they might say, for example, um, explain what the reactor core is. So you would say, oh, the, the reactor core contains the uranium and the control rods, and it produces the heat. You know what I mean? Or um, they might say... Um, um, how is the electricity generated? And you'd say it's generated by an electric generator and the movement is caused by the steam. The steam pushes it around. Do you understand? So, yeah? So the steam is very hot in, uh, in a nuclear reactor. Oh, yeah. I'd say this tank is huge. Like this would be... I'd imagine this being massive, you know? Because you see how big the power plants are, they're not small little things, they're huge, they're huge. So I would think this, you know, I, I don't know. So it's not the heat that generates electricity, it's the... It's the steam pushing the turbine around is what generates the electricity. And the heat makes free warm water for the town. So you get two things from it. You get electricity and you get warm water for showers and baths and all of that yeah yeah no it's good because people don't want to live by nuclear power plants but if you tell them you get free hot water then they might say oh okay that's fair enough you know all right if you can draw this as best you can please would free hot water encourage you to live beside one or not 
Oh, yeah, okay, all right. So that's... Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, why would you need free hot? You would need to live somewhere that gives you free cold water, is it? Don't need it. Don't need it, Does anybody know which country gets most of its electricity from nuclear power? Japan? I think Japan is high, but as a percentage, I don't know if it's the most. Yeah. Japan though does get a lot of its energy, huh? <laughs> they um I'd say see but they might not be as high as you think because they have a lot of natural oil and gas. I think, I'll have to double check on Wikipedia, but I think it's France. Which you might not have guessed. Do you have a couple of beers for lunch? Like I know Siva doesn't drink beer for lunch, right? Just for dinner. too tight. I told you about my adventures with my group work project and the other people in my group not doing their part of the homework. So the assignment's due today and they still haven't done any work. So they've asked for an extension. I'll never make my students do group work. It's just so painful. Uh, my master's I'm doing online is with Athlon IT. Do you know Athlon IT? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, data. the data one, yeah. Got another 100% of my maths test. No problem. <laughs> and I'm happy in my programming test. I got 90%. Well, I'm happy. You like study every day. Like no, I'm a bad student. I'm a very, very bad student. Why is it like all the money? You should. Yeah, pretty much. Um, pretty much. Yep. I can't. The only thing you could pay, maybe write less, 
is here. No, no, just write everything. Yeah, sorry, everything. Did you not give yourself enough space? She has a beautiful uh, reactor, let's see. It's not bad. Good heavens. Good what is that? Let's see yours, Kim. It's like 1% better. <laughs> Still better though. How you doing, Max? Nearly have it. Yep. Shall we continue, or do you need a minute, Ken? Yep. first use it. Um, I kind of feel like maybe they started testing them out in the 50s. I think. Uh, and they kind of became quite popular in the 70s, like in France. Because it was in the 70s they had the oil crisis where the price of oil suddenly, you know, it like tripled or quadrupled because, um, who was it? I think it was Iran or somebody cut off their supply to America and to the West. So that's when the nuclear power as an option, countries started looking into it more. So I'd say sometime in the 50s, became popular in the 70s. It's starting to become unpopular now because people don't like it. Which I think is unfortunate because it, it, it is, it is, um, is good form of energy because it doesn't release CO2. There's no CO2 released here, you know. No pollution. There is pollution though because what will happen is, which we'll see in a moment, is when the uranium runs out of energy, you have to dispose of it. Now, you can clean it up and, you know, do things to it. Some countries don't bother, they just dump it, you know. Some countries, like in the UK, they have a facility uh, which takes old nuclear rods and they cleans it up and recycles them, you know. So, uh, I think one of the reasons nuclear energy is not so popular nowadays is because people feel it's unsafe. And also, it's, it's expensive. You know, they're more expensive than, say, coal or oil because it's more complicated, the process, you know. Um, but I think it's important to have a balance of different energy sources. So I think, you know, I think countries do need some energy from nuclear, like maybe 10% or something. Because you, do you know the English expression, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket? You know this one? Do you know this expression? Do you know it? It means, you can imagine, if you put all your eggs in one basket, if you fall and drop the basket, all the eggs are broken. Whereas if you put them in two baskets, you know, you only lose half. The idea being that if you have all your energy coming from oil, what's the problem with that? Well, then maybe Saudi Arabia says, next year, no oil for you. Uh, we can get more money by selling it to Russia, you know. Or if you have all your energy coming from... Um, 
I don't know, like uh, coal, you know, same problem. You understand? So I, I think this is why France has so much nuclear energy because it wants to be independent. You know, because people in France they feel like they're in a superpower. Really, France isn't a superpower, but their politicians like to imagine that France is a superpower, like the U.S. or the U.K. or something like this. But you know, if I said to you, "Do you think France is a superpower?" you probably would say, "No." But they like to dream that they are. Uh, okay. So, um, nuclear fuel is a material that can be burnt by fission or fusion to, to make nuclear energy. The most common material used is uranium and plutonium. And the action... Oh, so, I think I told you this last week or this week. Uh, where does most of the uranium and plutonium come from? Remember, like what country? I no, I think uh, I think I said Australia. I think so. You have to mine it. You take it from the earth. Then you have to refine it. What does that mean? Like purify it. Yeah. Oh well, it's kind of the step before purifying. Like you know, remove it from the rocks and yeah. Then purify it. Then you have to use it. Then after you use it, you have to dispose of it which means you have to clean it up and bury it somewhere safe. This whole process is called the fuel cycle. Now, it's, it's not really a cycle, because it doesn't begin again. So, I don't know why they call it a fuel cycle. You know, it's not like, a, you know, in science class, you probably learned about the water cycle. You know, the rain comes down and then goes back up. So it's not really a cycle, but you can call it like a, like a process. Um, what do you need to write? Wait... You don't really need the first two parts. Uh, it's really the last sentence that's important for you to know. I was reading in the newspaper, uh, Matt, I think it's, uh, you know, the Republic of Congo. They, yeah, this country, uh, I think it provides 60% of cobalt. And cobalt is used in making the batteries for electric cars. You know cobalt? Have you heard of it, John? Yeah, so different countries do different things. So like in France, what they do is they, they bury it at the bottom of the sea and they cover it in concrete. Now they stopped doing that because they discovered that the concrete breaks open and the uranium leaks out into the ocean, which is not good for the fish. Um, some countries bury it in like a landfill, you know, like um, underground. Some countries bury it in old, old coal mines, you know. Um, and some countries like the UK, they try to clean it up before they bury it. You know, they try to, they try to remove all the radiation from it to make it safe. You know, so different different countries do different things. Uh, America does nothing. So when the nuclear energy runs out at the nuclear power plant, they just they just close the power plant and just leave it there. They they do literally nothing. You know, the, the power plant just, they close the door and say, That's, we won't do anything with that. And uh, it's a problem because it means you have these power plants around the country which are closed, but there's still radiation inside them. Now, it's not really dangerous because, you know, it's not like people are going inside the power plant and sitting in the reactor, you know. But still, you wouldn't want somebody to break in and steal it because... Although it doesn't have any energy, uh, you can use it to make a dirty bomb. Do you know what a dirty bomb is? It's where you take nuclear waste and you put it on a normal bomb so that when it explodes, it poisons people with radiation. You've never heard of this? Dirty bomb? 
So like you can take some old nuclear waste, put it around a bomb, when the bomb explodes, people get the radiation inside of them, as well as the explosion. You know? So it's not really safe just to abandon the power plant and leave it there. The problem in America is no, no state wants to be the state that takes all the nuclear waste. You know what I mean? Like if you say, let's build a giant plant in Nevada, then what are people in Nevada going to say? Like, no, don't. We don't want to take the entire waste for the whole country. Like, this is the problem with it. Nobody wants to be the place where the waste goes. So then what happens is just stays where it is. You know, it's a problem. Uh, did you say, Siva, your country has it or not? No. Nuclear power plants, no. But South Korea does have nuclear power plants, doesn't it? Yeah. And Malaysia doesn't. Right, did you got that, Jack? Now, in nuclear engineering, a neutron moderator is a material that reduces the neutron speed, thereby turning them into thermal neutrons capable of sustaining a nuclear chain reaction involving uranium or small fissile material. So wait, just before you write it down, just I explain this. This is the definition of what's called a moderator. So imagine that this is my uranium. The, new, the, the neutrons are flying off and they hit into uranium and make more energy. If you have too many neutrons, then you get too much energy and then it explodes. You don't want your power plant to explode. So you use a material called a moderator and this material, you can put it inside to slow the neutrons down so they're not going too fast. I think it's usually something like uh, carbon or boron something like that. So uh, you just need to say a neutron moderator is a medium that reduces the speed of fast neutrons. That's enough to write. That's enough. So. that? Siva? Yeah? Matt? Okay. And then we saw earlier the thing called control rods and they're used to control the rate of fission in your uranium and plutonium uh, and they're usually made of things like boron or silver uh, and so on. They're capable of absorbing many neutrons. So uh, can you picture this is our uranium Okay, and then what happens is the control rod, it can cover it up, releasing less energy, because it can absorb the neutrons. Um, and uh, I, I think you don't need to write all of these down. It's enough for the exam to remember one example. I am sorry, I thought carbon was an example, but I guess it's not. It's a boron just, you can just write boron down. So you could just say control rods are used to control the fission rate. Uh, they can be made from boron and they can absorb many neutrons. Continue. Yeah. 
Now, the, um, I don't have a picture of this reactor. I need to draw it for you. Because I don't think I could find, I keep, I keep forgetting to add it into my slides. Um, this is an example of what's called fusion. So, here you have uh, deuterium. Deuterium is just hydrogen. It's hydrogen with one proton and one neutron. And this uh, tritium is hydrogen with one proton and two neutrons. So this is H2 and this is H3. And what you do is you take your H2, you take your H3, you smash it together. Uh, if you have one proton and one proton and they stick together, you get helium. Now do you see what happens here? You have one, two, three neutrons. This only has two neutrons. So one neutron has released. So if you were to picture that as an equation, it's like this. Uh, what was it? H2 plus H3 becomes helium 4 plus a neutron plus energy. So these two, they're being smashed together. The word in English is you fuse them together. So this process is called uh, fusion. It's the opposite. In the beginning, what did we do? We took a uranium and we split it. Here, we take light elements, like hydrogen, and we smash them together to make energy. Okay. So uh, this is easier for you to draw. If you could try and draw this, please. So what I'll do next is I'll give you the definition, then I'll show you the reactor for it. So I need to remember to include a nice picture of a reactor. Uh, so what would you say the definition is? Smashing yeah. together. Maybe a more academic word than smashing together. Uh, but you, yeah, you have the idea. So nuclear fusion is a process of making a single heavy nucleus from two not lighter nuclei. This process is called a nuclear reaction. It releases a large amount of energy, like before. Okay. I need to draw the reactor, and then I'll do an example. studies. See? Got my AIT card right here. <laughs> no, it's all online. I only have to go on the registration day. I, I don't even have to go for that. They can send it to you in the post. I didn't... <laughs> I didn't even go to the one I had at Griffith College when I did the computing diploma. You know. 
I think the re like, I didn't go to the one marked in Griffith College because I didn't like the idea that you had to rent the robes you're supposed to wear. So I was thinking, I have to spend, what, like 50 or 60 euros to go to the graduation? No, it's okay, I'll just, uh, I'll pick the transcripts up later, thanks. Yeah, yeah. And very cheap, you see. When I was getting breakfast this morning, you know, I was in the coffee shop and I was asking for porridge. And they said, oh, do you want any toppings on the porridge? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll have some honey and fruit on it. And I saw she typed in that was an extra 120. And I said, oh, is it extra? I said, no, no, just forget about it then, thank you. Just plain porridge. All right, do you have that? Yeah. Uh, now, I'll try and draw the reactor, and you can draw it too. So uh, I'll explain uh, how it works. So, okay. If you had a gas of hydrogen, it would just leak out here. So here you have a gas of hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3. So you've got a gas of these two just mixed together. Okay. Now, what charge is this? Positive. And this one here? Positive. So I don't know if you remember this, but... If you use the left hand rule, if you have a, a current, a charge, and you put a magnetic field around it, then you get a force. And you might remember the formula uh, F equals, what is it? Uh, B, BQV. Magnetic field density, flux density times charge times speed makes the force. So what they do is they put basically a big magnet around this gas. So this provides a, uh, this is a magnet. And what the magnet basically does is it tries to keep the gas in the shape of a perfect sphere so it, it's like you can almost imagine the magnet is this room and it holds the gas in the middle in a ball shape can you picture that yeah so what happens next is um they have here little lasers so they fire the laser at the gas So what happens to the gas if you fire the laser at it? It'll get hot. Yeah. So what happens to the hydrogen and he uh, the hydrogen? What starts to happen if they get hotter? They'll start to move faster, right? If you can get it hot enough, they'll move so fast that when they hit into each other, they stick together. And when they stick together, they become helium and they make energy. You get the idea? So then what happens is the laser makes this hot but then the reaction makes it really hot. So inside this room it gets very very hot. So then what they do they have a little pipe here let me try and draw this. So And they also put here around the gas, they put lithium um, blanket. Like they just, they cover it. So if you can picture it here, imagine the wall is like the magnet and then inside the middle here is the hydrogen gas. In between the hydrogen gas and the magnet, they put lithium, okay? And what happens is when this gas gets really, really hot, it makes the lithium warm. And then they have a pipe, and you can kind of guess what happens here. Cold water comes in here, and steam comes out here. And you know the story, the steam turns the turbine and, uh, and so on. Now, why this is good is because it is 
safe. Because there's no chain reaction. If you want to stop the process, you just turn the laser off and then the whole thing stops. Simple as that. There's, no, there's nothing that can explode. It's 100% safe. Also, it's 100% clean. Because the hydrogen is not radioactive. It's just regular hydrogen. And what does it produce? It produces helium. And helium is safe. Okay. So the only thing that goes in to this process is hydrogen. And what comes out? Helium. So it's 100% clean. It's 100% green. So this all seems wonderful, doesn't it? But there's a problem. It's very, very difficult to keep this gas contained. Because the gas wants to try and um, expand. So you need very powerful magnets. So the bad news is, I think, I think the best is 30 seconds. What I mean is, they've been able to keep the gas contained for 30 seconds before it leaks and the whole process stops. This isn't really good for power in your city. You kind of need it to be on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But, you know, it's good. So the bad news is, there are, <laughs> it's 100% safe, 100% green, 100% clean, and 0% uh, of places use it because it's it hasn't been it hasn't been um, perfected it doesn't work yet it's only uh, do you know what I mean it's only theoretical it hasn't it hasn't been made to be commercial but I hope that this is what energy will look like in the future because like I said there's no co2 there's no radiation only helium that's all that comes out at the end. It's just eating. Um, is anybody here studying energy next year? No. Sometimes students study green energy, and I would consider this green energy. You know. Um, now you might say, "Well, hang on. Where did the energy come from for the lasers?" So what the people imagine in the future is you'd have something like this. Uh, you would have something like a, a waterfall and the waterfall you know it makes some energy and then this energy is used in the uh, fusion and this makes more energy for example if this laser has energy of Q then the energy that comes out in the electricity is 10 Q so it means for every one joule of laser energy you use, you'll get out 10 joules of electric energy. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's like you multiply by 10. So the idea is in the future, you'll have a small green energy source like waterfall or maybe solar. You put it into a fusion process and then out you get 10 times more energy. This is, is this the idea. Um, yeah, I suppose the problem is sometimes you might have to turn the machine off. So, uh, no, I got what you're saying. So once the process has started, you can put the energy back in for the lasers. But of course, if you have to turn the machine off, maybe to clean it, then uh, <laughs> where does the energy come to start it, you know? Uh, so you do need it to be beside some kind of green energy. Yeah. I think in Japan they're working on a fusion plant and there's a, there's a project between Japan and Europe to make the first fusion power plant. And if they're successful it means, you know, this, this solves global warming, no CO2. It makes less trouble with Middle Eastern countries, to be honest, because it means uh, you don't have countries. Well, you know, if we're being honest, you don't have countries like America or the UK interfering with Middle Eastern politics because of oil, right? I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything shocking by this. I think we all understand this, right? 
so this really would help with a lot of things. Um, if you can do your best <laughs> to draw this in, in... Oh, and before you do, there is somewhere where this occurs naturally. Can anyone imagine where this occurs naturally? This, pro this, this process here. It occurs naturally in the sun. The sun is a big hydrogen gas. The hydrogen smashes together and turns into helium and releases energy, which we feel. However, there isn't any lasers that are pointing at the sun. So what is the process that makes the atoms fuse together in the sun? What can we think it could be? It's obviously not lasers. We're not firing lasers at the sun. What is the process that fuses the hydrogen together to make it helium? What do we think? Any ideas? No ideas? Not even a guess? Not its own energy, but its own gravity. So the gravity of the sun pulls the hydrogen in. The hydrogen gets pulled into the center, smashes together, and becomes helium, and releases uh, energy. So eventually all the hydrogen will become helium and then there's no more energy from the sun. But don't worry, you'll be long dead before that happens. Okay, that's still billions of years away. Okay, if you can try and draw this now. Hashtag honest, you know. So this is like a man made sun. Exactly right, Matt. This is literally making a miniature sun to release energy. It's literally like that, yeah. Which is pretty cool. I mean, this is the type of stuff that's in comic books, but it's real life. You know? yeah, I, I seen a video a few years ago about men made sun. Yeah. Yeah, something like this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. favorite, huh? <laughs> Did you draw this? Okay, so I have just one example to do with you. Um, if I can scroll down. Uh, Chow, what do you want? What, are you studying psychology in Athlone? Yeah, psychology. Yeah. yeah, first choice. Second choice. First choice is what? Well. Psychology as well. Yeah. Okay. Have any of you ever seen this uh, fusion idea before? Or is this a new idea? It's new, yeah. I still think it'll be a while before it's if you were to ask my honest opinion, I think it's still, I think it's still fifty years away before they're able to build a working power plant on this idea. I don't think you'd be dead, would you? Fifty years? How old are you now? Ah, oh, no, it's we have a good chance to still to see it. Huh? Okay, that's very pessimistic of you too. <laughs> well, I'm older than you and I'm planning to see it, so. <laughs> <Good plan. laughs>
I want to see this now. This would be cool. All right. Uh, continue. Shall you have this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, let's take an example. Let's try and figure this out for. Um, I don't know if you can figure this out, Siva, on your phone. If if we type in, um, could we type in something like energy energy requirements for Dublin? Let's try and figure out how much energy Dublin uses. If we can get a number, I don't know if it gives anything easily. Do you reckon nuclear power? Oh goodness, no. In Ireland? no, 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 no. Spatial energy demand. Spatial energy demand. No, just type electrical energy demand. No idea. Uh, Kim, to be honest, I wouldn't trust Ireland to manage nuclear power. We have enough difficulties with some of the things we already have, non-nuclear. Any idea, Siva? And does it say how much energy that is? No. Clip's sake. Um, how about can uh, maybe someone else could try? Could you just? I just want to know. Google how much energy does Dublin use per day, or something like this. Yes, that's it. Give me the number. The Irish national average electricity consumption is 4,200 kilowatt per hour per annum. Kilowatts per hour per year. But, yeah, kilowatt hours per year, yeah, per annum. Now, is, but that is, that's per person or per house? I'd say that's per house. Okay, can you now Google how many houses are in Ireland? <laughs> Broadly speaking, we live in a three bedroom house and don't have any exceptional electricity requirements. Your consumption level is likely to be quite close to the national average. Okay, good, so it is per house. So can I someone Google how many houses in Ireland? Is it a million? What is it? Yeah, let's do Ireland, yeah. There were total 442,669 okay. of houses in the summer. Oh, these are just houses that are like just one unit. It's not part of like apartments or anything. So I don't... So it's okay, it's okay, Matt, it's okay. We'll, we'll, um, we'll just say there's a million homes in Ireland. It seems reasonable. Okay. So what I want to do, this question is, how much uranium, uh, what is it, 235 in the picture? My first diagram I gave you was uranium 235? Yeah. yeah. How much uranium 235 would Ireland need Per year. So let's imagine Ireland could get all its energy from nuclear power. So how much uranium would we need? So how much do you think that would be? Like, what would you say? How many kilograms? What, what would be the guess? Were we thinking a lot? Like what? A lot. Let's calculate, okay? So first thing we need to work out is how much energy do we need? So for one year, uh, the energy we would need would be there's one million homes, one, two, three, four, five, six, times, um, and I think they gave the number kilowatt hours, so 24 hours, and each hour, each home uses 4,200 
kilowatt hours. So we'll just we'll just round it off and say four thousand kilowatts. Okay, so this number here is how much energy the whole country needs per year. Can we calculate that? What's that, please? If you want to type that in. Oh, because that number they gave of 4,000 kilowatts is, uh, is how much, if a home is on for one hour, you know, if, yeah. Oh, sorry, times 365 days, yeah. Forgot about that. What do we get? Three yeah. times four, five, six. Yeah. Times three to the seven, uh, seventeen. Did you get that? What did you get, Siva? Three point five oh four times ten to the sixteen. Sorry, Chow. Three point five oh four. So three point five, three point five times ten to the sixteen. That's what they said. The two of them. Okay, continue. Right. Now, let's see how much energy we need. Um, so, what did we say? Uranium-235, wasn't it, becomes um, barium plus kryp krypton. Yeah? BA, sorry. BA. Okay. So, we'll need our phones again. What we need to do, um, I'll, Matt, if you could get the mass of uranium-235, and Siva, if you could uh, type in, what number was on the bar, the barium? Uh, 90, no. Uh, no, was it? 141, and the crypt? 92. 92. Yeah, okay, so um, Matt, if you could get the mass of uranium-235, uh, Siba, if you could get the mass of barium-141, and Kim, do you have your phone? Could you get the mass of KR-92? No, we need to be exact. Which one are you giving me, sorry? This one? What, what is it? No, no, just, um, just. Uh, for you, it's 235. 235. Point. Point. Four, three, it's 0.0439299. To you, atomic mass units. Yeah, good, okay. Right. Uh, maybe, Matt, then you could also get the next one, then, the BA. Did you, did you get it? Uh, you got this one? What is it? 92.9. Yeah. You. Yes. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, 140.9144110. <laughs> you. Yeah. Oh, and also, finally, what else comes out of this process? Um, three neutrons. <laughs> So just type in mass of neutron, please. Be the last thing. Oh, but what is it in atomic mass units? Is it you. Okay. Now. Which mass will be bigger, guys? The mass on the left or the mass on the right? Do you remember? Which is the bigger one? The uranium on the left or the barium, krypton and neutrons on the right? The left is bigger because the process, you lose some mass and it becomes energy. So let's calculate the loss in the mass. 
So that's 235, if you can type this in, 0 0.0439299 minus 140.9144109 minus 91.9 minus 3 times 1.008664 equals... Sounds like Matt is on his way to getting the answer. Got it? Oh, heartbreaking. You typed it in wrong. No! No! It can't be negative. It means somebody gave me the wrong number. No. All right, who gave me the wrong number? I... First, okay, guys, right, break my heart. I'm kind of suspicious of Kim's, uh, this one here. Maybe someone could check that, please. Okay, 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 okay. Say it again, 91 point... Nine, yep. Two, eight, one, five, six, two, one. Okay, try it again. If you could just change that one. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same. More minus. More minus, true. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, maybe it's Matt 235. Ah, it's me. I forgot something. I forgot to include this fella on the left. Ah, there's a, there was a neutron here, wasn't there? So... It's not just 235, I should have in front of this plus 1.008664 in before the 235. Okay, I'm sorry, I was blaming you guys, it was all me, I'm sorry. Positive now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is it? 0 0.1855. You. Okay, good. Now, this mass becomes energy according to Einstein's formula. So the energy equals, now you need to convert this into kilograms. Uh, what is it, 1.6, what was the U? You have it in from the last lesson? Ah, oh, that's enough, 1.66 times Okay, then multiply three times 10 to the eight squared. So what's that? Times 10 to the power of minus 10 joules. Okay, so just to be very, very clear, one reaction gives 1.49 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. How many reactions will we need? Well, we need a lot. We need 3.5 times 10 to the 16 joules, don't we? So the number of reactions we'll need will be that divided by that. So we need a lot of reactions. Okay. So we need this many uranium-235 uh, isotopes. Well, how, how big is that? Okay, well, let's calculate how big that is. Um, let's convert that into moles. So now the number of moles of uranium-235 
will be 2.35 times 10 to the 26 over 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So how many moles is that, please? Is it 10 to the 23 for Avogadro's number? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, okay. And you can It's the total energy required divided by the energy per reaction. I want to get the number of reactions required. Common sense, I think. You know, like imagine I said the process gave me one joule of energy and I need a thousand joules. Well, then I need a thousand of the, the reaction process. What do we get here? 390. 390 let's just say 390. 390 moles. Now let's convert this into kilograms. So can you Google molar mass of uranium-235? Ah, uh, roughly. Oh, okay, we'll just use 235. It's not exactly 235, but it's roughly 235. 235.044. Okay, 235, let's say. Grams. Right, what's that? Grams. Yeah? That's equal to 92 kilograms. That's less than me. Okay? Just picture that. If you had the amount of uranium equal to me, that would power the entire country for one year. Now you can see why people like nuclear energy. Because of its power. Okay, you only need 92 kilograms. Now, of course, that's if it's 100% efficient. But still, I think, you know, it's maybe 50% efficient, so that just means you need twice that. Still not much, right? How much oil and gas would you need? You would need thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of kilograms of oil and gas. How much uranium do you need? Just about 100 kilograms. So you can see why this is, you know, perhaps the future of energy. Yeah. Um, now, this is kind of a long question, so it's a good section B question where you have the different steps. Now, don't worry, you don't have to write this down because in your book there's an example, I think, like this um, that you could try. Let's see. Question two. In fact, question two is, is pretty much it. Can you see it there on page 151? Oh, no. Uh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Ah, uh, question two on the homework last night, last time, was like this one. Uh, the lesson for today is just more about definition. Did you finish the homework on 152? I feel like you probably didn't. Wait, wait, don't bother going to one five the next page until you've tried at least one five two. Oh I'm sorry, one one five one. How many of those have you done? Is it zero? That is zero. Zero amount? Kim? Oh Can you at least do question one before you go home? On page 151. And could you please do some homework this weekend, please? On page 151 and 153. 